I think we should probably start. We're already five minutes late. So the first talk this morning, I would like to introduce Marilena Doverde from the Cien Yang Institute of Theoretical Physics in Stony Brook University. And she's going to talk to us about cosmic background neutrinos in large scale structure. Marilena. Okay, uh, so I'd like to thank the organizers for having this uh, nice winter conference in Mexico and inviting me to uh, speak about some work that I've been doing recently on cosmic background neutrinos um, and the large scale structure of the universe. So um, before I get started in my talk, I just want to step back for a minute and give an overview of where I'm going. So when we talk about the large scale structure of the universe, we are talking about um, these big networks of filaments and voids that are inhabited by halos, where galaxies and clusters of galaxies live, like uh, Katrin has been showing us in her simulations. Now, um, so far, most of the time when we're talking about large-scale structure, we're just talking about the cold dark matter, or the cold dark matter and the baryons, because cold dark matter and baryons behave in uh, very much the same way, as long as you're on scales which are larger than um, the scales where baryonic pressure is important. But um, if we think of the dark matter of the universe, this is, in fact, not the whole story. And in addition to cold dark matter, um, our universe also has dark matter in the form of massive neutrinos. So we know for sure that our universe has at least two types of dark matter. Cold dark matter, which is responsible for forming the bulk of the structure in the universe, and then a warm hot component in the form of massive neutrinos. Um, and uh, you'll notice if these are slices from simulations by this group here. And you'll notice that the cold dark matter and the neutrino dark matter have uh, qualitative differences in their structure. The neutrino dark matter is much smoother. And um, that's why we need cold dark matter uh, to be cold to form structure. Um, but the rest of my talk, I'm going to be discussing um, some properties of the neutrino dark matter. So why have we not had to think about the neutrino dark matter so far? And the reason is, is that it makes up a tiny fraction of the mass density. So as I'll discuss shortly, we know we only have a lower bound on the, we have a lower bound, an upper bound coming from cosmological data sets, which I'll discuss, and then a lower bound from particle physics data sets on the energy density of neutrinos in the universe. So while there are tons of neutrinos, there are nearly, they're the second most abundant particles in the universe. So they're almost as abundant as cosmic microwave background photons. There's about one neutrino for every, um, there's about one baryon for every 10 to the 9 neutrinos. Um, the mass of these particles is very small. So so far, we can get away with analyzing cosmological data sets by ignoring the neutrino mass. And th that is just now starting to change. So something that I think is really exciting is this new future where we have to include both types of dark matter when analyzing data sets and hopefully learn more about the neutrinos. Um, so the outline of my talk is as follows. I'll first review some properties of neutrinos and then discuss the cosmic neutrino background. And then I'll go into the classic effects of massive neutrinos and large-scale structure, which are effects on the linear growth of structure. And then I'll discuss the, some additional effects of massive neutrinos that are more sensitive to things in the nonlinear structure growth regime that I've been thinking about recently in the observational prospects. Um, OK, so neutrinos, what do we know? Well, we know um, from particle, various particle physics data sets that there are three flavors of neutrinos, one for each of the um, charged leptons. Um, and uh, the constraints on the decay width of the Z boson tell us that there are no more neutrinos that interact via the weak interaction that are light, so less massive than the Z boson. Now, we also know that uh, for each of these flavors of neutrinos, or flavor eigenstates, there are three mass eigenstates, which I'll call uh, one, two, and three. Um, neutrino oscillation data tells us that the flavor eigenstates and the mass eigenstates are not the same. They're related by some unitary transformation, but a given electron neutrino is actually some linear combination of these different mass states. <clears throat> um, oscillation data gives us the square of the mass splittings between the eigenstates, so the solar neutrino oscillations tell us that the difference between two states um, by definition, we call M1 the smaller one, 
and M2 squared is about 10 to the minus 4 EV squared. And then atmospheric neutrino oscillations give constraints on a larger mass splitting between 2 and 3, or 1 and 3, because this number is so small, in comparison, is about uh, 10 to the minus 3 EV squared. So this is the information that we have about neutrino masses from the particle physics side. And, um, but we don't know the individual values, M1, M2, and M3, of the different neutrino masses. So there are several, there are three sort of qualitatively different ways of arranging the masses, M1, M2, and M3, that are consistent with this oscillation data. So the first one is that we make this M1 the lightest state and say that it has no mass. And then this mass splitting gives, uh, tells us that the second neutrino mass has a mass of about 0.01 eV. And this one tells us that the third one has a mass of about 0.05 eV. And this ordering is called the normal hierarchy. Um, we could also flip that around and make the two states which have a very similar masses be more massive, and M3 could be the, uh, have a approximately zero mass. And this is called the inverted hierarchy, and I have two states which have very similar masses of about 0.05 eV. Finally, if any one of these neutrino masses is large, or then about 0.1 eV, then these mass splittings are tiny in comparison, and this is called a degenerate hierarchy. So even though the masses are not exactly the same, they still have to respect these mass splittings, um, they're all about the same value. So these, an interesting question from the particle physics side is to distinguish between these uh, three scenarios. Um, from the cosmology side, what I want you to remember from this is that no matter how I arrange these neutrino masses, there's at least one state which has a mass that's more massive than about 0.05 eV. So we know um, there's at least one, the, the, at least one of the neutrinos is as massive as 0.05 eV, maybe more massive, and maybe the other additional neutrino states are also more massive. Um, <clears throat> so if I uh, draw a cartoon of the information about neutrino mass, um, I have uh, this lower bound on the neutrino mass from oscillation data that I have one state which is more massive than 0.05 eV. And then I have upper bounds coming from a variety of experiments. So on the sort of particle physics side, um, the direct measurements, the di direct constraints on the effective mass of the anti-electron neutrino are less than about 2 eV. And these come from looking at the maximum energy of electrons that's emitted in tritium beta decay. So that ener the energy that's emitted, um, <clears throat> sorry, the energy that the electron carries it has an upper limit, which is uh, that some of that energy that's emitted in the um, decay must go to the rest mass of the neutrino. Um, so the Tritz experiment gives us sort of 95% confidence upper limit of 2 eV on that mass. Um, and then the future of these experiments, the next one is called Catrin. Um, there are a few others called Project 8 and Ptolemy. And the upper bound is forecast to go from being 2 eV to 0.2 eV um, on the mass, this effective mass assigned to the anti-electron neutrino. <clears throat> on the other hand, um, cosmological data sets are already in order of magnitude better. Um, as I'll discuss briefly, and the cosmology is primarily sensitive to the sum of the neutrino masses, um, whereas this is an individual mass. So um, if I just take CMB alone, measurements from Planck data, then the upper 95% upper limit on the sum of the neutrino masses is a half an eV. Um, so if, this, if the sum of the neutrino masses was detected to be a half an eV, then the individual masses would be at most a third of that, because this is the sum. So that's why I'm saying that this is an order of magnitude better. If this was found to be 2 eV, then if you sum up the three masses, the mass splittings would be small compared to 2 eV, then you would have 6 eV of neutrino mass. Um, but if I combine CMB data with BAO, or there are other uh, constraints in the literature combining um, galaxy clustering from different surveys, I can improve the constraints on the sum of the neutrino mass from 0.5 eV down to about 0.17 or even 0.11. I've seen some numbers in the literature recently. Um, so this is really exciting because we have a lower bound, and then we have this upper bound, which is marching down. And that means that uh, we should, if uh, we understand standard cosmology the way that we think we do, and we can interpret the astrophysics of our data sets, there will be a detection of neutrino mass via astrophysical data sets in the next five to ten years. So this is a really exciting um, time to be thinking about neutrinos. <clears throat>
that's right. So, so I'll discuss what the observables are, and there are degeneracies. Um, but I think, I think this is really fair. I mean, we have no reason to think that the cosmological constant is not constant, but we do know that we have to have massive neutrinos. So this is, um, I think, this is, a, I think it's, this is a scenario where it's interesting to open up the parameter space, but it's 100% fair to say we know these particles exist, and the mass is a free parameter that hasn't been measured. And we have no, this is, in fact, the only guaranteed extension to the standard cosmological model is neutrino mass um, at, at present. Um, but yeah, and that, that's, that's an inter a, a reason that, another reason that I would say it's interesting to be thinking about what, what other observables there might be related to neutrino mass to distinguish between, um, this, distinguish between physical effects of other parameters. Um, so as has been discussed by a number of the uh, really nice contributed talks and uh, their plenary talks and lectures, there's a ton of large-scale structure surveys that are coming online now and have existing data or um, will have fantastic data in the near future. So um, there's large-scale structure surveys and then maps of the cosmic wave background, which are primarily sensitive to neutrino mass through the secondary anisotropies, like uh, gravitational lensing or um, the sunyaev zoldovich effect. But, um, the state of the field is that we expect that this, some various combinations of these data sets will be able to give a one sigma constraint on the sum of the neutrino masses of 0.02 eV. And this would be sufficient to detect even the normal hierarchy at the three sigma level. Um, okay, other reasons that it's fun to think about neutrinos is that um, there are unknowns about neutrinos on the particle physics side. So in particular, there are various experiments, uh, LSND, Rooney Boone, and some reactor anomalies that have been interpreted as suggesting the presence of an additional neutrino mass state, which is sterile because of the, those constraints from the width of the Z, and um, has a mass splitting that's of order in EV. So this would be an additional neutrino um, state, which should be abundant in the universe to some extent, and um, has a mass of about an EV difference. Now, this is... Um, not settled in the community, and I like to take this uh, quote from this paper here um, about, about light sterile neutrinos, which says data so far presents a picture where there is two to three sigma evidence in favor of an additional sterile neutrino and two to three sigma evidence against it. Um, but it, so it, the, from my perspective, uh, from cosmology, it's important to remain open to the fact that there could be additional sterile neutrinos, and this is a place where astrophysical observations can play a role. Um, and uh, furthermore, the, there's not just these observational anomalies, but there are questions about neutrinos, um, such as what gives rise to their masses. Um, we don't know the absolute mass scale, the sterile neutrinos that I just mentioned, and whether neutrinos play some other important role um, in like leptogenesis in the early universe. So um, neutrinos are fun to think about, is the point of this. And then in particular, astrophysics and cosmology has something, is uh, poised to play a great role in answering um, these two questions, or at least uh, provide information about that. Okay, um, so now I'll talk about neutrinos and cosmology and the cosmic neutrino background. Um, here is a cartoon thermal history of the universe with some interesting epochs on here. So here we are today, um, when the universe is much colder, um, earlier galaxies formed, if you go back um, much, much earlier, then the universe was hotter, and um, the atoms were not ionized, but were, sorry, atoms went from being primarily neutral to being ionized, as Raphael has discussed. Um, at much higher temperatures, we have uh, Big Bang nucleosynthesis. At even higher temperatures, these nucleons um, dissolve into um, protons and neutrons and so on. And at very, very, very high temperatures, we have um, neutrinos. The, the temperatures and density are so high around an e MeV that uh, neutrinos are in... Um, thermal equilibrium with everything else. The scattering of neutrinos off other particles is frequent. Um, so at these super early times, neutrinos are in thermal equilibrium, which means that uh, their temperature is, by definition, the same as the temperature of the photons that um, make up the cosmic microwave background today. And so at these early times, there's a common temperature with all the stuff that's in thermal equilibrium. Um, but as the temperature drops below about an MeV, the neutrinos decouple from everything else. Um, and after they've decoupled, the temperature of the neutrinos 
drops with 1 over the scale factor of the expansion, just like everything else. Um, <clears throat> since uh, the neutrinos were in thermal equilibrium at these times, and they are relativistic Fermi-Dirac particles, knowing this one number, the temperature, completely characterized their distribution function. So given the temperature, I can figure out what the number density of neutrinos is. It just goes like the temperature cubed. And given, um, and I can also determine the energy density of the neutrinos while they're relativistic, and this mass term is unimportant. It just goes like the temperature to the fourth. Um, so uh, the temperature of the neutrinos is something that we can actually compute in terms of the temperature of the cosmic microwave background photons. And um, it's a little bit different because after the neutrinos decoupled, when the neutrinos were still in thermal equilibrium with everything else, there was also a population of electrons and positrons which were in thermal equilibrium, right? The um, mass of the electrons about a half an MeV. So um, after neutrinos decoupled, electrons and positrons um, eventually uh, annihilated and froze out also. And uh, the annihilation of the electrons and positrons boosted the energy of the stuff that was left in thermal equilibrium, in particular the photons of the cosmic microwave background. Um, so that means that the photons, the CMB was heated a little bit with respect to the neutrinos. So while they had a common temperature here, after the neutrinos decoupled, the CMB got a little bit more energy, but by an amount that we can calculate. So it turns out that the, the CMB we know is about 3 Kelvin, and the cosmic neutrino background should have a temperature of about 2 Kelvin um, by doing this exercise. And a temperature of, a two, of 2 Kelvin gives a number density of neutrinos of about 336 per cubic centimeter. So these are ridiculously abundant particles. They just have a very low mass and uh, not very much energy, which makes them harder to detect. Um, so given, given that number, we can ca calculate things like the energy density and radiation at times when the radiation was dominated by the photons and by the mass of neutrinos. So here, uh, energy density and radiation, temperature of photons to the fourth. This is the part coming from the CMB. And energy density and neutrinos, temperature of the neutrinos to the fourth power, which we just calculated. And this can be written, um, I can allow the number of neutrinos to be this free parameter, which I'm calling n effective, which is roughly the number of relativistic fermions with temperatures that are what we expect from this uh, calculation um, relative to the CMB. And uh, cosmic microwave background data puts uh, great constraints on this. Raphael might talk about it more, um, how, how these numbers come about. But um, the radiation energy density of the universe affects distant scales, which show up in the, the damping scale and the peaks of the cosmic microwave background. And this gives, uh, allows us to ask how many neutrino-like particles we think there were in the early universe. And these numbers are remarkably consistent with what's expected from the standard cosmological model. The effective number of species is um, very well constrained to be about it's three plus or minus things like 0.2 to 0.3, um, depending on the combination of data sets. So this is uh, indirect evidence for the presence of the cosmic neutrino background at early times when the neutrinos were relativistic. Um, if I want to learn about neutrino masses, I need to study the cosmic neutrino background at later times when the energy density of the neutrinos is dominated by their rest mass. And so that comes to looking at neutrinos in large-scale structure. So here are some slices from simulations, a uh, movie about simulations from Andre Kravtsov, showing smooth initial conditions um, with tiny fluctuations in the density that are hard to see here, growing into the large-scale structure we see today. And the key point is that um, the... Um, that uh, the presence of massive neutrinos affects this process. I, it depends on what you're doing, but it's, it's straightforward to calculate, right? The energy density is just the sum over the momentum with p squared plus m squared. Um, I mean, they, in CAM, the, the correct distribution function is used for neutrinos. There, uh, the, yeah. There are various approximations because things can become hard to calculate in some codes, so it's not universally true, but um, especially calculating things at the background level and the linear level, that's um, straightforward. Okay. Um, so 
Talking about large-scale structure, I'm going to talk about a couple of things, just the growth of structure here and focusing on the large-scale linear evolution of density perturbations. And then I'm also going to talk about halos, which are these nodes in the density field hosting galaxies and clusters of galaxies. Um, I'm also going to keep, I'm going to say cold dark matter, but I'm talking about cold dark matter and baryons, which are behaving in largely the same ways on the scales of interest. But I'll just say cold dark matter to keep things simple for the most part. OK, um, so massive neutrinos qualitatively change the way structure grows in the universe. And the reason is the following. If I start with a overdense region, which is a coherent density perturbation in the cold dark matter and neutrinos at early times, um, and I wait a little while and ask how this density perturbation behaves, the neutrinos have large velocities and can stream out of this overdense region leaving behind the cold dark matter and baryons, which will collapse a little bit under their own self-gravity, but less than they would have if they'd held on to these neutrinos. Um, on the other hand, uh, there's only so far neutrinos can travel. And if I'm looking at a very large scale density perturbation that's large in comparison to the typical distance neutrinos travel in a Hubble time, then the different behavior between cold dark matter and neutrinos is not very apparent. And this large scale density perturbation is able to hold on to um, its neutrino component. And what I have is an overdense region of dark matter, cold dark matter, baryons, and massive neutrinos all growing coherently. So um, the linear evolution, the gravi linear gravitational evolution of density perturbations now depends on scale. There's one, uh, one evolution in the very large scale regime where I have faster growth because I have neutrinos cold dark matter growing together. And then a smaller scale, um, and on smaller scales, the structure should grow more slowly because the neutrinos are contributing to the expansion, but they're not contributing to the gravitational collapse. And the physical scale that separates these two regimes is called the neutrino free streaming scale. And it's roughly the velocity of neutrinos um, divided by the Hubble time. Um, now, that, this different growth, of the evolution of density perturbations, changes the typical amplitude of density perturbations we see on all scales. So um, of course, this, the typical amplitude of density perturbations is characterized by the matter power spectrum. And what I've plotted here is the ratio. Um, I'm keeping the total matter density fixed. And as I increase the fraction of the total matter density that's in massive neutrinos, the small scale density perturbations are suppressed, um, while the very large scale density perturbations stay the same due to this free streaming effect. Um, so these are different examples of neutrino mass hierarchies. So I have a normal hierarchy where there's about 0.06 eV mass in neutrinos, the inverted where there's about 0.1 eV, and then uh, allowing much more mass in neutrinos, individual masses of 0.1 and 0.2 eV. Um, so one minor point just to point out, we usually, the dominant thing that this growth is sensitive to is the energy density and massive neutrinos, which is the number density times the mass of each species. But there's some residual sensitive sensitivity to the individual masses, because this effect depends on when the neutrinos became non-relativistic. And um, the location of this free streaming scale um, that characterizes the, where the suppression is. So the solid lines use correct neutrino mass hierarchies, whereas these dotted lines of the same color here, instead of having 3.2 eV neutrinos, I've given this uh, cosmology 1.6 eV neutrino. And you see that there is a slight difference. So uh, people often say cosmology can only measure the sum of the masses. And in practice, that's probably true. But strictly speaking, they're, they're physically distinct effects um, and observations. So uh, we can use cosmological data sets to um, test how much suppression in the amplitude of the power spectrum can be tolerated. And this, um, in turn, gives a constraint on the energy density of neutrinos and the neutrino mass. So this is a plot also from um, the Planck 2015 paper showing uh, constraints on the sum of the neutrino masses depending on which uh, Planck data set is used. So just temperature, power spectrum alone, adding gravitational lensing um, from the reconstruction, lensing reconstruction in the CMB, adding external data sets like BAO, and so on. And these curves shift around, but there's a very robust upper limit on the sum of the neutrino masses of about a half an EV to down to maybe 0.3. Um, and this will only get better. So again, the 
future data sets are forecast to get down to something like 0.02 EV, which is, should be a detection of neutrino mass, or telling us that something is really different than we think about how, um, this, this, within the standard cosmological model, this signal must be there. Okay? Um, so, uh, now I'm going to move on to talk about effects of massive neutrinos getting into the nonlinear regime, so nonlinear gravitational evolution where the amplitude of density perturbations is large and the formation of halos, which is a harder problem than the linear evolution. And because it's harder, I'm going to use some simple calculational tricks to discuss the effects here rather than run um, full simulations. While there is um, Katrin's group and other groups have done increasingly um, great work adding massive neutrinos to large-scale structure simulations, it remains something that's a bit tricky. Um, so the physical effects of neutrinos in large-scale structure, the first one is the suppressed matter power spectrum, which is tested via gravitational lensing or by looking at the uh, galaxy clustering on very large scales. Um, the, this suppression of the matter power spectrum also means there's fewer massive halos hosting galaxy clusters, and another constraint on neutrino masses comes from looking at the abundance of galaxy clusters. Um, there are a couple of other effects that you might not have heard about, which I'm going to talk about also, which are that uh, this scale-dependent growth of, from massive neutrinos gives rise to a scale-dependent halo bias. Um, and then, of course, eventually the neutrinos, this cosmic background neutrinos, slow down enough that their typical velocity is comparable to the escape velocity of massive halos, and the ha neutrino halos can actually accrete onto the seed cold dark matter halos. Um, I'm going to talk about this scale-dependent bias first, because it's a new effect that I think is really interesting. OK, um, first, let me step back and talk about halo bias um, from a very big picture perspective. Um, so if you recall, if I look at this mass distribution, this is a slice from the Millennium Simulation by Volker Springle showing the distribution of mass in the universe here, the characteristic filaments and voids and so on. And this is the total distribution of matter. Over here is a slice from the same simulation showing the distribution of galaxies. And what you can see is the distribution of galaxies and the distribution of matter are not identical, but are very, very similar, especially if you look on very large scales. Um, <clears throat> and uh, one, one way that we can characterize this is by looking at the correlations in the galaxy, co the correlation function of the galaxy distribution. And it turns out that if I go to very, if I look at galaxies which are separated by very large distances, this distribution is approximately just proportional to the correlation function of mass distribution. And this proportionality constant d, we call the bias. Um, and I'm going to sweep under the rug for the moment the fact that galaxies, that halos are bound globs of dark matter where galaxies live, but those are Understanding the distribution of galaxies is a harder problem than understanding the distribution of halos. So I'm going to treat halos and galaxies, uh, I'm going to use those words interchangeably, but of course there's lots of interesting work to understand how galaxies populate halos and so on. Um, so one way of understanding why the halo distribution traces the mass distribution is the following. If I imagine that I have some fluctuations in the density, which are drawn by this squiggly line here, Dark matter halos form in these extreme regions of the density field. So if the um, density fluctuation is above some value, say, these peaks up here can collapse and form a dark matter halo. And um, if I take, if I look at density fluctuations which are themselves in an overdense region, so on top of a long wavelength density fluctuation here by this yellow thing, then this threshold to collapse and form a halo is a little bit lower. So it turns out that it could be easier to form halos if you're, excuse me, already in an overdense region. Um, and um, additionally, if I live in this slightly overdense region, I have more peaks which are above my threshold for halo formation, so I'm going to form more halos. But because this region is overdense to begin with, these little proto-halos, um, th this region of volume that hold, hosts those little proto-halos will collapse a little bit under its own self-gravity, and so the number density of halos is also boosted at later times. 
because of the volume change of the background density. Um, and these are two pieces to building a simple description of halo bias. One is understanding how the number density of halos um, is altered by the background density, and another is understanding this uh, increase in the number density due to the volume collapsing a little bit. Um, but the bottom line is that this, this picture gives a description for how the number density of halos will vary from place to place, um, tracing the long wavelength fluctuations and the matter density. Um, <clears throat> um, and this uh, factor here, which shows the response of the fluctuations in the number density of halos in some sort of Taylor expansion with the fluctuations in the density, this uh, linear piece here is just is the term that we call the halo bias. Um, <clears throat> okay, so now I want to think about halo bias, but add two types of dark matter to the universe, include both the cold dark matter and the mass of neutrinos, and think about how the presence of neutrinos changes the simplest model. Um, uh, and as long as I'm thinking about pretty light neutrinos, like masses of 0.1 EV, 0.2 EV or less, then the typical velocity of those neutrinos is still big compared to the halo, halo escape velocities. So I can ignore the actual nonlinear clustering of neutrinos in the halos and just treat the neutrinos as, just consider the effects of mass of neutrinos on the um, background. So now I have a new picture where I have this fluctuations in the density here, and some peaks in these density fluctuations are going to form halos. But if I ask what the background density is, I have two things that contribute to the background density. I have the cold dark matter, which I'm drawing as this blue line, and massive neutrinos, which I'm drawing as this yellow line. And we know that the evolution of cold dark matter and neutrinos is a little bit different on very large scales. Um, so if you recall this picture here, where if I'm looking at a very large scale fluctuation, these cartoons were probably not sufficiently exaggerated, um, cold dark matter and neutrino perturbations grow coherently, whereas if I'm looking at a smaller scale perturbation, then the cold dark matter density um, grows, illustrated by the blue line continuing to be big, um, whereas the neutrino density perturbations just decay away quickly, illustrated by this yellowish line getting a little bit flatter. Um, and so I, would, I will claim that the scale-dependent evolution of these long wavelength modes, um, which are the wavelength of them is uh, 2 pi over k, k is the wave number, will cause the threshold for collapse, so the um, excess number of halos in these overdense regions, to depend on the wavelength of the background mode that you're considering. Um, and um, this, uh, I was interested in thinking about this because I was interested in how massive neutrinos change the normal picture of structure formation. But there's some precedent for thinking about how scale-dependent growth of density perturbations affects the halo bias. And that's by these nice papers by Lampuy, Kyle Parfrey, and Ravi Sheff, who studied um, the, how modified gravity models which affect, which can cause scale-dependent evolution of density perturbations to change the halo bias. Um, so, but uh, their work wasn't directly applicable because they're thinking about scale-dependent growth due to modified gravity associated with the onset of acceleration at late times, whereas massive neutrinos cause density perturbations to be scale-dependent, have scale-dependent evolution at all times. Um, uh, and finally, the change, the way that this volume mapping works between cold dark matter and once I include the neutrino dark matter is um, different than uh, the usual case with just cold dark matter. Um, I think that's getting a bit technical. But the, the bottom line is that the halo bias factor in a universe with massive neutrinos one can use simple models to calculate the difference or build increasingly complicated models using simulations to study how halo bias has changed. And the claim is that the um, halo bias factor is on very large scales, 
large compared to the neutrino free streaming scale is not the same as the halo bias factor on scales which are small compared to the neutrino free streaming scale. And if one does these calculations, um, you get something that looks like this, where this is what's plotted here is the scale dependence of the halo bias normalized to be one on very large scales for different um, masses of neutrinos. And if I increase the neutrino mass, then the halo bias um, transitions to being a little bit larger on small scales relative to the case of just mass of neutrinos. And this transition point is around the neutrino free streaming scale. Um, the amplitude of this effect is very small. It's just proportional to the fraction of the energy density that's in massive neutrinos compared to the out, out of the total matter density. So these uh, shifts here are like a percent or something that's very tiny. Um, <clears throat> and in, in general, I find some formula that shows there's a change in this quantity of the halo bias, which is proportional to the mass in the fraction of the energy density in massive neutrinos and also depends on the overall value of the halo bias. Yes? Yeah. Um, yeah, so um, the question is, we know that neutrinos suppress the total structure on small scales, why are small scales the ones that are more biased than large scales? So it depends a little bit on the bias of the objects that you're looking at, but one way to think about it is that um, I, it depends on what you're plotting, but for a fixed, um, because the small scale density, perturba the, the density perturbations on smaller scales have decayed, if I look at the number of halos in a region with lower density, with a lower amplitude density fluctuation, if I have a fixed number of halos, that's a higher bias. Um, so in other words, the bias is telling me how many more halos I, if I tell you the amplitude of the density fluctuation, the bias tells me how many halos I should see. And um, if that density fluctuation has decayed a little bit, um, then I will see, then, but I still see like 10 halos, then I will think that that region is more biased than if I had a larger amplitude density fluctuation. Does that make sense? Sorry, it gets a little bit. Yeah. We, um, there's, okay, so there, there are two effects. One is from the density perturbations decaying, and the other is from, this is also, I'm plotting here the scale dependent bias with respect to the total matter fluctuations. And on small scales, I don't have neutrinos, I only have cold dark matter. So if I was looking at the, um, but on, on large scales, I also have neutrino density fluctuations, but they're not helping me form halos, let's say. So that gives this shape of a bias. Wait, sorry. Um, okay. Um, so I'm claiming that there's this scale-dependent change in the bias, which looks like this. Um, exactly where this pound sign just stands for a number, which is about 0.6, which I can calculate numerically. Um, now, why would I care about this tiny effect? The suppression in the amplitude of the matter power spectrum is much larger. This is a scale dependent change in the bias proportional to F nu, where F nu, all we know is that it's bigger than about a half a percent. So there's a tiny fraction of the energy density of neutrinos. Um, why, why would I care about this? And the reason I would care about this is two reasons. One um, is that the bias itself is actually an observable. So if I can detect this shift in the bias, then I have a new way of measuring neutrino mass. Um, and halo bias is particularly interesting because it's a quantity that can, is actually not subject to cosmic variance. Um, and the other reason is that if I don't know about this, then um, this is actually a systematic for measurements of neutrino mass from galaxy clustering because galaxies are biased tracers. So um, first I'll talk about the part as a systematic. So this, is the, this plot is showing the suppression in the matter power spectrum as a function of scale. It's uh, similar to the one I showed earlier, but I've used different colors. And um, these lines show the suppression in the matter power spectrum for different um, neutrino mass hierarchies. So increasing neutrino mass increases the suppression. Now, if the halo bias were constant, 
then the suppression in the galaxy power spectrum would be the same as the suppression in the matter power spectrum. And I would just be looking at this exact same thing. But I've just told you that this halo bias has some scale dependence. And the sense of that scale dependence is that it increases a little bit on small scales. So this now changes the suppression in the galaxy power spectrum relative to the suppression in the matter power spectrum. So the galaxy power spectrum for this particular biases is a little bit less suppressed on small scales. And even though that's a small effect, the total suppression is a small effect. So it can be this scale dependent bias can account for, say, um, 30, 40% of change in the suppression that I would be looking for. Moreover, um, the difference between the matter power spectrum and the uh, galaxy power spectrum here actually depends on the bias of the sources themselves. So now the neutrino mass constraints have some, with the scale dependent bias, neutrino mass constraints from galaxy clustering alone have um, degeneracy with halo bias. Um, OK, on the other hand, you could try to just measure this quantity itself. And the reason this is interesting is that um, if the, I have a deterministic halo bias, then that means that you give me the mass distribution here, and I just multiply it by some number b to get the galaxy distribution. So if that's how bias works, then bias isn't a random quantity. It's just some deterministic function that takes you from mass to galaxies. And since it's not a random quantity, it's not, it doesn't, we don't need a lot of realizations of the universe to measure it, unlike um, the power spectrum where I need to measure many, many Fourier modes and ask what their distribution is in order to get the power spectrum. The bias, in principle, I could measure from, say, a single mode of the density field. And this is something that's been pointed out um, by a, a number of authors, in particular, Ur Selyak and uh, Whaley Penn. Um, so just to say that again, the error on the bias is the kramer rao bound on the error on the bias is roughly 1 over the square root of the number density of galaxies times the matter power spectrum. So if I have an infinite number of galaxies, or at least a very large number of galaxies, then this, um, I can measure the bias perfectly. On the other hand, if I'm thinking about, say, the power spectrum, there's a fundamental limit on how well I can measure the amplitude of the power spectrum. Even you know, for a finite number of Fourier modes, which there are, there's a fundamental limit on the measurements of the power spectrum, and this is uh, something we call cosmic variance. So um, here's an example of showing um, a very large number density of galaxies. So here I have uh, about 10 to the minus 2 h inverse megaparsec cubed galaxies, and I'm using this simple measurement of the, or ulti simple um, prescription for the error on the galaxy bias. And uh, what I want to be con looking for is the scale dependence of this ha halo bias um, as a signature of neutrino mass. So this is a forecast for a large number density of galaxies of how large the scale dependent signature would be um, for different neutrino mass hierarchies. Um, so you, need a, you would need a huge number of sources, but what you're looking for is this difference between here and here. Um, and for comparison, it's the magnitude of this effect for, say, a 0 0.05 EV, 0 0.1 EV mass in neutrinos is comparable to detecting um, non-Gaussianity with FNL of order 1, for those of you who have thought about scale-dependent bias from non-Gaussianity. Um, and you could similarly measure this with something like this with the ratio of the halo biases of two populations. Um, this also gives new observables. You could look at the angular power spectrum of galaxies and the lensing convergence, for which you have generally have a much higher number density of sources, because you're, if you're using photometric galaxies. And um, you could look at things like the ratio of the galaxy lensing cross-correlation to the galaxy-galaxy autocorrelation function. And in a scenario where the halo bias is exactly constant, this quantity does not depend on halo mass. So I realize you can't see it from this plot, but with constant bias, all of the curves overlap with this black line, which has no neutrino mass. But including the scale-dependent bias prescription, this quantity now depends on neutrino mass, and there's a measurable separation um, between these things. Um, OK. So, so I think that this is, this is, there's many 
possible astrophysical systematics to take into account to be thinking about this, but I think this is a potentially um, really interesting new way to try to get information about neutrino masses or other um, contributions to the matter density that don't cluster that might give rise to similar effects. But um, let me talk about a couple of other things that are just slightly different. So the neutrinos are small, low mass particles, but there's this cosmic neutrino background of um, th hundreds of neutri 333, um, 336 neutrinos per cubic centimeter. So even though the masses of these particles are tiny, they will eventually um, accrete onto the cold dark matter halos that host galaxies. And so here's one way of looking at that. This is the phase space distribution um, for neutrinos. Given the temperature of neutrinos, which we know to be 2 Kelvin, um, you can convert that temperature, the, that momentum distribution from the relativistic Fermi Dirac distribution, into a velocity distribution function depending on the masses of the neutrinos. So what's shown here is the number of neutrinos um, as a function of velocity for different examples of neutrino masses. So clearly, if I have light neutrinos, then their typical velocities are much larger than if I have a neutrino that's heavier. So this is 0.05 eV, and this is about you know, 0.5 eV, these curves down here. So the point to illustrate is that some, the uh, also shown on here is these vertical lines which show the typical escape velocities for halos of given masses. So a 10 to the 15 solar mass halo might have an escape velocity of a few thousand kilometers per second, whereas at something that's 10 to the 13 solar masses um, might have a typical escape velocity of order you know, less than 1,000 kilometers per second. So even if most of these neutrinos are moving very, very quickly, there is still, even in the lightest, this minimum mass case, there's still some population of neutrinos whose velocities are below the escape velocity of the halo. And those neutrinos um, can uh, accrete onto dark matter halos and form a neutrino halo around the cold dark matter, which is one way, one way of thinking about it. Um, and there are some interesting things that are qualitatively different about how neutrinos, um, neutrino halos form than cold dark matter halos. So one, the velocities of these guys are large, and they accrete onto the halos at late times. And this gives rise to neutrino halos, which are typically much puffier in comparison to the dark matter. So the density profile of massive neutrinos is much shallower at large radii than the density profile of the cold dark matter. Um, and even though the neutrino masses are small, and they probably only make up a tiny fraction of the total mass of the halo, there's still a ridiculous amount of neutrino mass that can be bound around cluster size halos. So for a 10 to the 14 solar mass halo, I could have 10 to the 10 solar masses of massive neutrinos, which are bound around that halo. So it's probably way too hard to detect at any point soon, because that's a 10 to the minus 5 or 4 correction to the total mass of the halo. But it's interesting to think about nonetheless. Um, and um, finally, let me tell you about something that's some work in progress, which I think is really fun. Um, which is also related to the fact that the way neutrinos mass ac accumulates around halos is different than the way cold dark matter mass accumulates. And that's the following. Um, typical dark matter halos have bulk velocities. So our Milky Way is moving at 500 kilometers per second with respect to the cosmic frame. And um, if I ask what the typical, and these bulk velocities don't affect the formation of cold dark matter halos, because if I have a big blob of cold dark matter um, that's forming a halo, if it's moving with respect to the cosmic frame, if, if all of that cold dark matter is moving together, then it just collapses and continues to form a halo. And that, that bulk velocity is probably not very important. On the other hand, um, if these um, halos are moving at hundreds of kilometers per second with respect to the cosmic frame, the, say the CMB, they're also moving at hundreds of kilometers per second with respect to the cosmic neutrino background. So now the picture of how neutrinos accumulate onto a halo is not a halo sitting at rest with respect to the cosmic frame, seeing the sea of cosmic background neutrinos around it accumulating, but a halo that's moving at a large velocity into this 
wind of cosmic background neutrinos. Um, and uh, this um, is interesting because, so for instance, this is a plot of the velocity distribution of neutrinos. Um, and if the halo was at rest with respect to the cosmic frame, it would just see this velocity distribution, this average velocity distribution for neutrinos in the cosmic frame. But if I have a halo that's moving with respect to the cosmic frame, then um, if I'm moving into the neutrino wind, then I will see a boosted velocity distribution in front of me and a lower velocity distribution behind me. Um, so this is some work that's in progress with Tang Yan Lin and Ben Safdi. And um, these are some nice calculations done by Tang Yan showing uh, how this both velocity would change the density profile of neutrinos around a halo. So this is a density plot of the overdensity in massive neutrinos for neutrinos that have a mass of 0.1 eV around a 10 to the 14 solar mass halo, which is moving at 600 kilometers with respect to the cosmic frame. So this bulk velocity might be a little bit high, but um, with the halo moving in this direction, we see a clear anisotropy and the, um, the neutrino, uh, there's a clear anisotropy in the overdensity of neutrinos around this halo. Um, along the direction of motion. Um, and uh, here is a much more extreme example showing a much more massive neutrino um, with a mass of about 0.5 eV, but a lower mass halo, 10 to the 12 solar masses. And in this case, the uh, effect of this bulk velocity of the halo moving with respect to the cosmic neutrino background is much more apparent. Um, so this is, these are just preliminary calculations, and um, we're developing uh, code that can handle this type of relative velocity between the halos and the cosmic frame um, in more detail. But it's something that I think is really fun to think about. This, it's probably too difficult to observe this neutrino halo period, never mind notice this anisotropy and uh, detect something about the bulk motion, but it's fun to think about uh, futuristic applications of um, these ideas. Um, and in particular, both for looking at, say, gravitational lensing measurements of the um, density profiles of halos, um, depending on their bulk velocity, say. And it's also, um, this type of effect is also relevant for these su super futuristic experiments which aim to detect the cosmic neutrino background directly, which is partly how I got involved working with particle physicists um, on this particular program. So um, just to wrap up, uh, I, I hope I have convinced you that it's, uh, there are interesting things to think about. Um, with massive neutrinos, incorporating massive neutrinos into the standard cosmological model. There are classic effects of neutrinos suppressing the small scale density perturbations. Um, neutrinos also suppress the abundance of halos, which I did not discuss in detail, but eventually can accumulate an, onto cold dark matter halos, forming neutrino halos, and can also induce a scale dependent correction to the halo bias. Um, so I, I'll stop there. Thank you very much, Mary Elena. Uh, is, yeah, this sound. Are there any questions over there? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So the trade-off, I would say. Um, that's right. So this plot did not show up very well, but um, the I, I think it's yeah. I, I don't have a final answer. So let me let me repeat the question. So here I'm I'm showing the halo bias, and I'm showing it to be essentially constant for massless neutrinos, and then having some scale dependence when I increase neutrino mass. But if you look closely at the scales on this plot, this is 10 to the minus two inverse megaparsecs here, and this transition between um, one bias factor and another bias factor is actually not so different from the nonlinear scale. So I might worry, if I'm looking at the measured halo bias, I'll start to see other scale dependent effects around here, the nonlinear scale, just due to nonlinear gravitational evolution, nonlinear halo bias, or even peak constraints, and that's been studied. Um, so I think that that is probably the limiting factor for using this. Um, and uh, that may be a showstopper. Um, 
the reason to be more optimistic is that this scale-dependent change is, it's not a different scale than we're already using to constrain neutrino mass. So if I look at this plot and I say that what we want to do is look for the suppression of the matter power spectrum out here, and then the, the scale-dependent bias changes it, th these are scales that we're hoping to use anyways. So it's a question of, and it, it may be that we don't understand halo bias well enough to use bias tracers or something, and you have to use lensing. But I think it's worth, I guess right now I'm taking the perspective of just pushing this idea as far as I can until we see what the observational limitations are. Yeah. Another question? In, yeah, in principle, um, this is not the best. I, did, I put it kind of, th this is not the best plot, but um, in principle, no, because the non-Gaussian bias for the classic local type non-Gaussian entity has a very distinct shape, which is it goes like 1 over k squared out here, because it's coming from, um, you're relating, you have a bias factor in front of the gravitational potential instead of the density, and so that Poisson's equation gives you a k squared. Whereas this um, is, um, sorry about all these plots. Um, this is really some kind of step where I have one constant value at scales which are much smaller than the free streaming scale and another at much larger scales. Um, so the, I would imagine that uh, observational constraints, you could use template shapes to try to constrain the two where I know the shape of this and I know the shape of the non-Gaussian bias, but in practice, in practice, I'm sure that there's constraining both would be particularly challenging. Another question? <coughs> yeah, um, so let me see, do I have, um, I'm trying to think if I have a plot, something in here that shows. Yeah, um, so the question was, in what ways does cosmology depend on not just the sum of the neutrino masses, but the masses themselves? Um, and the answer is um, the following. Um, the simplest answer I can think of is the following in two ways. So one, um, if I ask, if I ask um, what the difference in the amplitude of the matter power spectrum is here compared to here, um, the, the, so the reason that's, so the, there's, not power, there's less power here because the neutrino perturbations on those scales have gone, but that's also um, slowed the growth of the cold dark matter perturbations. And um, that, um, if I want to compare the net amplitude <laughs> difference between the massive neutrino case and the non-massive neutrino case, I need to know how long those perturbations have been growing differently to some extent. And this depends on the time at which the neutrinos became non-relativistic which is just the temperature over the mass. Um, but the temperature over the mass gives the scale factor at which they became non-relativistic. So the, if, if I imagine having um, uh, an EV neutrino that became non-relativistic around decoupling, um, and if I had 100 you know, 0.01 EV neutrinos, then um, those are non-relativistic at redshift 20. So I would, you can imagine seeing a difference there. Um, the other way that it's different is that the transition between the suppressed power and the non-suppressed power is, uh, depends on the neutrino free streaming scale, which is just the mass. Oh, I mean, it's the velocity times the Hubble time. And um, the, that uh, is, that, so it, becomes, it depends on when they became non-relativistic, which depends on the individual masses. So I think at the end of the day, you end up with something that's like proportional to the energy density of massive neutrinos, which is the sum times a logarithmic correction that depends on the individual masses. And since it's logarithmic, we usually can't really see the difference for observable ranges. There was another question over there, Juan. So in principle, there are 400 neutrinos per cubic centimeter here. So because of the clustering, how much this number change? I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? So there are 400 neutrinos, relic neutrinos here in one centimeter. Uh, cubic centimeter. Because of the clustering, this 400 number, uh, ho, what is the change of this relic density of neutrinos? I'm sorry, I, I missed the beginning. So the, the question is about the relic density of neutrinos. What is the number? So in principle, if you don't consider the clustering, there are 400 neutrinos. Yeah, three th it's, it's, it's like 50, 
two per eigenstate or something like that. So it's, it's 336 overall per so cubic centimeter. Because of the clustering, yeah. no, what is the number you are expecting here in the neighborhood? Yeah, of so, so that's interesting, and that's, um, that's a question of, there, there's a nice paper by um, Ringwald and Wong, uh, maybe eight, ten years ago now, that um, showed that for the neutrino masses that we're probably going to see, the excess, the overdensity in the center of a halo is probably just uh, tenths or something. But if you go very, very deep in the halo, you can get overdensities of um, order, you know, unity to like tens, say. Um, but that uh, depends very strongly on the, the mass of the neutrino. For, so for something like 0.1 EV, the clustering is um, probably order unity or less, depending on where you are. But it's of interest. There are some experiments that hope. Um, I'll just derail for a second because I think this is really interesting. So the constraints on the the direct constraints on the neutrino mass come from looking at the maximum energy of an electron that's emitted in tritium beta decay. So there, the tritium beta decay, I have um, uh, the neutron goes to anti-electron neutrino, electron, and proton, and then I measure the energy of the electron. Um, and I plot the energy spectrum of that, and I see the, mass, the maximum mass. Now there's another process which um, would allow that electron to have a little bit more energy, and that's if a cosmic background neutrino hits the neutron first, and then the maximum energy of the neutrino is, um, or sorry, the maximum energy of the electron that's emitted is boosted a little bit by the rest mass of the cosmic background neutrino. So there are, this is an old idea from Steven Weinberg, and there are some experiments that are super futuristic, like 20 years from now, that are hoping to detect that. And then the, what the local density of neutrinos is, is important for predicting their, and any excess gravitational clustering will boost their potential signal. Any more questions? No? So let's thank our speaker again. Thanks. I think